morning, everyone. This is from us. Yeah, no. <laughs> Come closer. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, it's good to uh, be here in person and to see a lot of familiar faces. I also want to thank uh, Chief of Detectives James Essick for joining us. And let me publicly actually uh, congratulate you on your recent thank you. promotion. Thank you. Congratulations and thank you for being here. Today, we're here to discuss the intersection between gun and gang violence and the mayhem that led to the death of Devell Gardner Jr., a one-year-old beloved baby boy. In July of last year, we were all horrified and outraged to see depictions of images of two gunmen shooting indiscriminately towards a park where people were having a barbecue. That image was seared into our minds. Uh, four people were shot. Three, as we learned, were wounded. But baby Devell Gardner, just 22 months old, lost his life. We now know that those responsible for his death are members of a violent street gang called the Hoolies. And I'm pleased to announce that 18 members of that gang, including two charged with murder of baby DeVell, have been indicted on various counts of murder, attempted murder, conspiracy, and weapons possession, among other charges. I know that today's indictment will take some of the most prolific and violent offenders off the street and will have a positive impact on the quality of life and safety in Brooklyn, especially in central Brooklyn and especially in the Bedford-Stuyvesant area of Brooklyn. Now we're gonna get up in a moment a Facebook of the 18 men who've been indicted today. This important indictment of Hooli gang members solves four murders and eight non-fatal shooting incidents among other charges. In total, we have 13 shooting victims, including a number of innocent bystanders. If you look carefully, Anyone who has a red shadow around their box is charged with murder. And if you count, there are 10 of those 18 men who have been charged with counts of murder in the second degree involving their, their involvement in these cases. If you recall, just this past January, we also indicted 19 gang members of a different gang, a gang called the 900. And they were indicted for shootings and homicides also in the Bedford-Stuyvesant area. The Hoolies are their primary rivals. And today's indictment is the second part of that investigation. Taking violent gang members off our streets of two rival gangs who are at war with each other demonstrates our resolve in stopping these shootings a cycle of retribution and retaliatory actions against each other that threaten the safety of all of us. This past year has been tough in terms of gun violence in the city. This indictment takes a step in trying to reduce that violence. And the most high profile homicide in this indictment is in fact its most heartbreaking. And I'm talking again about Devell Gardner Jr., who was only 22 months old 
sitting in his stroller when he was shot and killed this past summer. Three other men were injured in that shooting. One was 27, one was 35, one was 36, and they weren't gang members. Today I can announce that we have indicted two offenders who were responsible for Devell's homicide. There's a picture of beautiful Devell Gardner. We allege that defendant Deshaun Austin was one of the shooters. And his co-conspirator, who was acting in concert with him, who drove him to the scene of that park to conduct this shooting, is a man named Akeem Artist, who we've also indicted for this homicide. He was the driver of the vehicle. Now this case was solved thanks to the great work of the New York City Police Department, the detectives that are here. This was an extremely e intensive and extensive uh, investigation of hundreds of hours of video and other investigatory techniques to go back and track these men. Um, and what we learned looking at this case was that on the night of July 12, 2020, a three-car caravan left what is known to be the Hoolies headquarters. That's also located in Bedford-Stuyvesant. The investigation showed us that the Hooli gang often used three-car caravans when they were planning to commit a shooting. Each one of these cars has its own unique role in these shootings. One car was referred to as the blocker car. That car was meant to block a police cruiser if they should happen to run into the police. They had another car called the chaser car, and that car was to speed off to make the police chase them and lead them away from the third car. The third car, the shooter car, is the car that contained the gunman. In this case, Akeem Artist was the driver of the car that contained the shooters. We saw on other video that the Hoolies believed that rival gang members were in the park celebrating and enjoying a barbecue. They circled the block around Madison where the park was and you will uh, learn that the vehicle that Akeem Artis was driving pulled over, double parked, let out two men who turned out to be our shooters, and one of them is Deshaun Austin, we allege. Another vehicle, a white Mercedes, waited up the block, and then these two men that got out of the car indiscriminately began to shoot at innocent people in the park. Can we watch the video? Up highlighted in the top is the two men walking up the block towards the park. And right now they're shooting. We're going to see more images. You see people running in the background. You see people running in the forefront. You saw a car reversing, trying to get out of the way. We're going to replay it a few times. Here's a, a closer view. They're walking up the block. The man that's wearing the hood, the white hood on the camera, we allege that's Deshaun Austin. And we have other evidence of his involvement in this case. Watching it again, another replay. Two men walking. There's an arrow, and what you're gonna see is them extending their arms, and that's when the shooting begins. There you go. Both men are now shooting, and if you see in the background, people are scattering, running for their lives. They continue to shoot, and now they run towards the other, one of the other cars in the caravan, the white Mercedes. That's their getaway car. Here's one final view of this in really slow motion. You see the three women walking in the forefront of the video. They hear the shooting. They start to run as well. And you can see the people in the back really scattering running for their lives. This is a horrific video because there you see the gunman running now to the white Mercedes, which is all the way on your 
on the corner of the video, um, that's the getaway vehicle. Here's another image, another angle. You see the shooters. You can actually see where Deshaun Austin runs to, gets into the car, and that's the park where baby Develle Gardner lost his life. Now, as I've already said, four people got shot that night in Develle too small, too young to survive his injuries. I met his mother early that night, um, and I've talked to her, I've seen her multiple times since then. And I promised her that this office, the Brooklyn District Attorney's Office, would do everything in its power to bring those responsible, the killers of Devell Gardner Jr. to justice. I'm taking this first step, and I'm happy to be able to say that this is a first step towards fulfilling the promise that we made to that family to bring justice for their son. This indictment not only brings us one giant step closer to get justice for Devel, but for the other families who lost lives and people who've been shot as a result of the violence that these members of the Huli gang have inflicted on Brooklyn. The other disregard that these gang members have for the sanctity of life puts us in our entire community in jeopardy and danger. I'm gonna show you a few more videos that show the recklessness and the audacity of this group. But one of the things I wanted to share with you is what things we learned about in the investigation that we didn't know beforehand. And one of the interesting things we found is how these gangs and crews, in particular the Huli gang, use social media to fuel the violence. We learned that they used a phone app. There's an app on their phone which sends encrypted instant messages, a group chat, to all of their gang members. And they use this encrypted instant messaging system um, to coordinate attacks, to alert each other when rival gang members were in their neighborhood, to dispatch shooters to shoot at people. Uh, and I'm gonna give you a few examples um, from one of the group chats that we have. I'm just gonna read it, because I know it's hard for all of you to see back there, uh, but we're gonna make sure it's available so you can review it yourself. And defendant Jaquan Lane says, where's AJ? Tell him to spin Jeff. Now what that means is to shoot up Jefferson Street. Spinning is a type of violence that it's a gang terminology, spinning the block, shoot up the block. So he wants him to spin Jefferson. Uh, one of his co-defendants, Deshaun Austin, who is the shooter that we allege involved in the murder of Devel Gardner, says, I'm calling him now. You'll see another defendant, Jonathan Arroyo, putting an image of a car where they think the rival gang members are. Rivals. And Jaquan Lane says very clearly, the, the rivals, the, the bombers, appear to be in that car. If you see it, flip it. That means to shoot up that car. All right. Just two days later, another conversation that the police were able to obtain. There's a, a man named Rasheen Parnell. Now, he's the only person that's been indicted that is not currently in custody. And I urge anyone who's hearing this, if you know where he's at, please call the police and let us know. If he's hearing this, I urge him to surrender himself and face the consequences of his action. But 
Rasheen was worried about this group chat. He understood that this could be dangerous if law enforcement ever got a hold of how they were communicating with each other. And he says, and take that effing chat down, boy. It's no good. Jaquan Lane says, it's good for our safety, bro, because they use it to communicate when rivals are around. And whatever happens, we got to be alive. They have more communication about that. Yeah, facts. Uh, Jaquan Lane says, the messages get through to everyone quickly, all at once. Rasheen is still worried, says, but we have to win across the board, meaning we don't want to die, but we also don't want to give the evidence to the police. Just every night, delete that conversation, he begs. Please, boy. And Jaquan, not seeming to understand the import, says, facts, but it's hard to tell everyone when ends are spinning an S and stuff, meaning he feels they need this device to continue to alert the gang of other gang activity. And Rasheen finally says, just clear that S every night for the safety of the gang as well. They agree to do so. And then finally, Rashawn Parnell, who again I urge to surrender himself, says, if ends get locked, arrested with the phone, stuff is gonna be nasty, bro. Meaning the gig would be up. And he was onto something because these group chat messages and the communications that the police were able to get, coupled with other evidence, helped us figure out exactly who was responsible for driving the violence in our community and who was responsible for many of these shootings. Now I'm gonna back up and just quickly tell you a little bit about the Hoolies. They're based in Brooklyn, in Bedford-Stuyvesant, um, mostly out of the Roosevelt houses. Their primary rivals, who we've heard, it's a 900 gang, are based in Tompkins and Sumner houses. Um, but their reach is far beyond these housing developments. And in fact, in the first incident that we charged in this investigation, now this is a 63 count indictment, we're not gonna go through all of the cases and all the incidents, but the first incident took place on May 15, 2018, and that's in the Marcy houses. Um, the victim in the case alleged to be a rival uh, miraculously survived being shot multiple times at close range. And we allege, based on all the evidence that we've obtained, that the defendant is that man, Jerry Washington. Uh, can we watch this video? This is at the Marcy houses. Middle, middle of the morning. Coming to the left are the shooters, the shooter, and on the guy who's coming forward, he's on a scooter. He gets shot, knocked off the scooter, sh shot more. Miraculously, he survived. Um, we'll see a replay of it. This is the shooter and some fellow Huli members escaping, as you can see. They uh, helped Jerry Washington escape. There he goes. They give him a scooter so that he, there's the gun. And he starts to scoot off. Fortunately for all of us, there was some very good um, surveillance video in the neighborhood. And we were able to track him and get a great um, photo of him. This is just one of many incidents, but what we learned during the investigation was that there was one particular incident that sort of supercharged the beef and, and, the, and the rivalry and the violence between these two rival gang members. And that was a shooting that actually had taken place on December 4th, 2018. 900 gang members, meaning members of the 900 gang, had infiltrated into what was considered Huli territory, the turf of the Hulis. 
And some members of the 900 gang uh, started to shoot at Huli gang members. Among those Huli gang members who were being shot at, and we can pull up the December 4th photo, uh, was defendant Akeem Artist, the, the driver in the Devel Gardner homicide, another defendant named Oris Howard, and another Huli gang member who's not part of this investigation, Jaheel Grant. Defendant Akeem Artis gets shot, um, and Huli member Jaheel Grant also gets shot, and he dies as a result of his injuries. Shortly after that shooting of Huli gang members within their own territory by 900 gang members, over a dozen Huli gang members go to their headquarters, and we allege that they plan retaliation for their shooting for that shooting. The shooting and killing of Jaheel Grant unleashed a night of calculated, cold-blooded shootings. And during the next several hours, the Hoolies committed at least three shootings, injuring four people, including the murder of Tyree Walker, which we'll talk about, another brutal shooting that left a 23-year-old man completely paralyzed, and the shooting of two other innocent people. Neither of those victims were believed to be bona fide gang members. They simply had the bad luck of living in rival turf. Now I'm going to take a look very specifically at this homicide case. We have some video that I'd like you to see. Um, the killer, we allege, based on all the evidence, is a man named Travis Scott, who we also allege is one of the founding members of the Hooli gang. What you're gonna see in a minute is you're going to see a man walking up the pathway, going towards the building, seemingly oblivious to anything around him. He appears to be looking at his cell phone. And you're gonna see another man, who we say is Travis Scott, running behind him. And then you're going to see a cold-blooded execution. Can we see this video? There's the victim walking, there's well, who we alleged Travis Scott running behind him and just executing him right there. I'm gonna watch it one more time in slow motion. You can start to see the victim, Tyree Walker, coming up to the building. And if you see carefully, he's looking down at his phone. Travis Scott, who you see a, a picture of there, uh, executes him virtually at point blank range. Police do a tremendous job in tracking his movements before and after the crime, so we can identify him. I'm going to show you another disturbing homicide that took place in March of last year. Again, these are all Hooli gang members. This case took this homicide took place March 3rd, 2020, and we allege, based on all the evidence, that the shooter in that case. Uh, was a guy named Deshaun Austin, uh, and that he was acting in concert with Jaquan Lane. As you know now, Deshaun Austin is the shooter involved in DeVell's homicide. And they follow a man named Janiel Witted from another bar, another location. They follow him um, to this location Deshaun Austin, you will see in a moment, ambushes him and kills him, murders him in front of many witnesses in front of a busy nightclub on Nostrand Avenue. Can we watch this video? 
That's Deshaun Austin walking, covering his face. Uh, we have video before and after the incident identifying him. The victim is wearing the white hat. He was just shot right there. We'll see it again in slow motion. The victim is wearing, Janelle Witt is wearing a white hat in the video. He just walks up to him, shoots him point blank, and then runs back to the vehicle where um, his code, Cooley member and co-defendant on that case, Jaquan Lane, was waiting for him. Again, this is a cold-blooded assassination in front of many people. And simply, the motive was because he's a member of a rival gang. There's him running away and ultimately that's the reverse image of the shooting, but him running back to the car. I'm gonna show you two other non-fatal shootings um, that happened over the summer spate of violence. We'll look at one that happened on June 24th. I chose to show you this one because who's involved again? A key artist, the driver who brought the gunman to the shooting of Devel Gardner Jr. And this is a non-fatal shooting. Um, what you're gonna see quickly is that the defendant, Akeem Artis, gets a gun from an accomplice. What you can't see on the video that we have is that Akeem Artis is targeting a black sedan and the occupants of that sedan. He's shooting at the occupants of the sedan. And what you will see in a moment is that the sedan starts to shoot back at him. Um, and that he has to run for cover while he continues to fire recklessly while people in other cars are in the street. Let's watch this video. That's him grabbing the gun. He will start to run up towards the black sedan. There are other people on the street. There are other cars on the street, as you can see. He starts to run. Now he's firing. He has the gun in his hand. He's, he's hiding now because they're shooting back at him. And he continues to shoot. You see the glass shatters out of the park van. See it one more time. There you go, firing. Other cars, other people, as you saw them on the street, continues to fire. And finally, just to kind of highlight how nonchalant and how callous members of this gang have been, I'm going to show you a last incident from August 8th of 2020, where we allege, based on all the evidence, that the gunman is a guy named Divine Moore. You see a photo of him right there. Now, what we learned is that a rival gang member was dropping off his girlfriend, uh, we allege the Divine, Defendant Divine, approached the car, had a few words with the driver, and then shot four times into the vehicle. Uh, let's watch the video. He approaches the car, the, the, the female gets out of the car, they're having a conversation, he pulls out his gun, the driver tries to get away, there's the gun in his hand, you can see it very clearly. He's now shooting. At the vehicle, the girl is standing right there, hiding, trying to get away. He continues to shoot. Yeah, he nonchalantly walks away. You can still see the gun in his hand. He's carrying a bag in his left hand. The gun's in his right hand. Puts the gun in the bag. His, fellow, his friends continue just to kind of watch. You'll see him cross the street now and walk up several car lengths into a car that he, he has a access to, and he's going to ditch the gun in that car. So there you go, he's walking up the block. He now gets into the car. The police respond to the shooting. Um, they find four casings on the ground where he was shooting, and ultimately they find the gun in that vehicle belonging to the defendant. Now, 
These were chilling videos. In of themselves, each one of these cases were most of these things happened in front of people. There were a lot of innocent folks around. This is a type of gun violence that has made people fearful to leave their homes. Fortunately, as a result of today's indictment, these men are off the street. Most of them are facing 25 years to life for their involvement in these killings. Some of them are facing more time because they've been involved in multiple incidents of violence. These are exactly the dangerous types of people and the type of action that this district attorney's office working with this police department will continue to focus our resources on. Long-term investigations such as these are so important to public safety and a part of a comprehensive strategy to stop the scourge of gun violence. But they're also about holding people accountable for the damage they cause in our community. We're going to continue to work to get guns off the streets and target firearm traffickers. We all know there are too many guns on our streets and the police make arrests for guns each and every day. We'll work with violence interrupters and other community organizations to try to stem the violence from happening in the first place. But this summer, we're going to be laser focused on curbing gun violence. Last summer, nearly 50% of the increase in gun violence in Brooklyn happened just in two months over the summer. So we're going to work with the NYPD and our federal partners and all of our law enforcement partners to be laser focused on this crucial mis mission of stopping gun violence. Today is an important victory for the people of Brooklyn and especially for the residents of Bedford-Stuyvesant. I had the opportunity to speak to DeVell's mother and father earlier today, and I hope that today's indictment and the accountability will be a small measure of solace for the family as they seek justice, and also to the other survivors of this violence. My sincere thanks to the police department, to the violence suppression unit, to all the prosecutors in my office who worked on this case day and night during COVID, um, during difficult times, uh, especially to the violent criminal enterprise unit and the homicide bureau here. Uh, these cases are time consuming, they're complicated, they take meticulous investigations to solve. And you guys, all of you did a tremendous job and I am thankful for all of you they also make a big difference in our safety. So we're gonna hear now from Chief Essek um, and then some other members from the police department and then we'll take any uh, on topic questions. Thank you. Good morning everybody. I'm Chief James Essek, I'm the Chief of the New York City Police Detectives. Uh, first off, I wanna thank uh, District Attorney Eric Gonzalez and his team. Uh, they've been great partners with the NYPD throughout the years in, in uh, bringing to fruition these long-term investigations that's had a, a great impact on the shootings. Uh, also with me is Inspector Jason Savino from the Gun Violence Suppression Unit, his team from Gun Violence, and I, I just want to thank them for the hard, tirelessly work they've done, along with all the detectives from Brooklyn North Homicide, the local squad who worked on these cases. About a month and a half ago, I was, had the honor to be named the uh, New York City Police Chief of Detectives. Uh, this case was the first case I was briefed on. Uh, why? Because, as the district attorney said, the heinous acts of violence were out Brooklyn North by this gang, uh, but also because of the open homicide of an innocent 22-year-old child, the 22-month-old child, excuse me, Deval Gardner. Today is the beginning of bringing those responsible for this horrible crime to justice. This case focused on a violent street crime that literally terrorized Brooklyn neighborhoods uh, will have a serious impact on crime. And by doing these such cases in these long term investigations, we'll be able to substantially reduce some of the violence we've seen in the recent months going forward. As our courts open up, and our long-term grand juries, such as this one, are impaneled. We, in the NYPD, and especially in the Detective Bureau, have prioritized our cases 
in which we focus on the small amount of people who think it's okay to fire a gun in New York City. This is unacceptable. Uh, it is my mandate to all my detectives who work for me in the Detective Bureau that we will investigate relentlessly, as have we done in this case, to bring those small number of people who engage in violence to justice. This case and others coming forward that will come down will have a long way to reducing that violence in New York. Uh, so with that, I'd like to turn it over to Inspector Jay Savino, who will give you a background on the case. He's the commanding officer of the Gun Violence Suppression Division. Jay. Thank you, Chief. And thank you to the DA. So first and foremost, like I start every uh, press conference, I have to give kudos and extend gratitude to our case detectives. Um, right, standing right behind me, the first being Doug Rome and Mike Alagiri. Now these two case detectives, along with the 7, 9, and 8, 1 squads, the dedication and commitment to this miss mission really set an example throughout anybody watching, any young aspiring police officers, this is what it's all about. And it was under the leadership of our entire team who kept and maintained boots on the ground, not only through our pandemic, but through many other challenges as well. Now, it shows that NYPD never slows for a second and always performs at the highest level. Let's get into the case. So Hoolies is an investigation uh, addressing a violent gang that falls under the Cho umbrella. The case was initiated to address and combat violence in and around the Bed-Stuy area, uh, primarily Roosevelt, uh, Tompkins, and Sumner Houses. Uh, we utilized our next level precision policing policies and addressed geography and certainly the right subjects, the trigger pullers that the chief alluded to earlier. Now when you look at the same geography, uh, 2019 versus 2020, the area was up over 100% in shootings, so we were certainly in the right area. You talk about the right subjects, trigger pullers that endanger our good people of the community. Just to kind of assist in painting a picture, three specific subjects uh, that are now in custody, investigatively, we believe are involved in at least four shootings apiece. Now regarding the acts of violence, 17 total acts of violence are alleged many occurring in the last year or so, so we're talking very recent violence. When you break those down, and I'll just note the particulars of a few, some of it's gonna echo what the good DA said earlier, but I think it bears repeating. You're just gonna see the scope where this gang targeted and sometime killed, really for sport. In fact, we believe at one point they may have even kept a score against the opposing gang. Truly showing no remorse and endangering once again the great people of our community. So right now, five homicides are alleged. I'll briefly mention a few of the victims, and once again, um, we'll be repeating some. Tyree Walker, we saw the video, 37 years old, shot and killed December 4th of 2018. As retaliation, why? Simply because he was in the opposing territory, uh, mistaken for our bad guys, thought erroneously, um, and, and obviously it, it led to, to his assassination. Janelle Witted, we saw the video again, March 3rd of last year, really starting a new life of sorts after enjoying himself with others, celebrating a night out, encountered our subjects and was shot and killed as a result. And of course, Devel Gardner, 22 months. I think the best way to describe it is this is a young soul that never got the chance to experience life. These horrific acts of violence carried out just once again to benefit the gang. Really, really nasty stuff, as bad as we've seen. Eight non-fatal shooting incidents are alleged. One uh, worth mentioning is a 20-year-old uh, victim, 22-year-old, never been arrested. Uh, simply present once again in a pot, uh, opposing territory, coming home from work, minding his own business. The bad guys asked if he was 900, which is an opposing gang. When the victim denied, he was told he was lying, and he was shot on the spot. Thankfully, the gun jammed, uh, preventing them from shooting him once again. But as the victim winced in pain, just to paint the picture, the bad guys added insult to injury and stated, give me your phone, check him for verification to see if he was, in fact, in that gang, which he wasn't. Four shots fired attempted murder incidents um, ultimately will be on the sheet. 
These incidents really display the sheer brazenness of this gang, that bullets were fired without regard, truly endangering the public. I'll just note two very briefly, and they both occurred in August of last year. On August 8th, uh, Divine Moore with others, uh, approximately five o'clock, beautiful summer day. You can see the video, if we played it a little longer, uh, you'd actually see children in the playground enjoying themselves. Once again, approaches the vehicle while holding a gun, um, fires recklessly numerous times, and calmly walks away like nothing happened. About a week later in the same area, uh, August 16th, Brandon Lee allegedly fires aimlessly as vehicles pass. Numerous rounds were fired in return. Um, amazingly, nobody was hit. But when all settled, 30 shell casings were left at the scene of this incident, indicating at least 30 shots were fired. You have to remember, every shot that fired is going somewhere. It shows the recklessness. These incidents truly display that this gang and these subjects had no regard for anyone that was in the area. Now, needless to say, uh, this gang so ruthless, we de dedicated tremendous, tremendous effort and dedication to combat them. Our investigative techniques uh, included recorded calls, uh, video surveillance, social media, cell phone tower analysis, and DNA and forensics, doing everything we can to protect our community. In all, 18 subjects were apprehended as a real result of our collective investigation. These 18 individuals lived and terrorized our Brooklyn neighborhoods. Now these same individuals that showed little or no remorse as they fired guns are behind bars. A lot of kudos to go around. Um, our investigative chiefs in respect of uh, Brooklyn, we've been attached by the hip throughout, thank you. Uh, Eric and his partners at the DA, um, Al DeGeneres uh, specifically has been an absolute godsend over and over again, thank you. And our coach and leader, Chief of Detectives, Jimmy Essig. Lastly, our team, who worked tirelessly at this mission, enabled a successful outcome, and I have to mention the community. This is why we became cops. This is why we became cops. You called, we answered, and as a result, our community is safer. Thank you. So, I'll let Orin uh, facilitate any questions, any on topic questions. You guys um, brought in Deshaun Austin for questioning in July of last year, and that's when he got charged with the Witted killing. What changed between then and now when you already had him as a suspect in the Gardner killing uh, that allowed you guys to charge it a year later, almost a year later? It was, it's an ongoing investigation as you indicated um, he had been placed in custody on another matter and as we continue to let me just take this off I'm sorry as we continue uh, to investigate the case and build a case that's strong enough to survive the rigors of trial to make sure that we seek justice for Devel uh, we built this case and it, it's a you know factually strong case of guilt against him and uh, we will continue to continue to build on that investigation to hold all of the other people that were responsible for um, Devel's death responsible and uh, so it's an ongoing investigation Noah um, the fact that he had been in custody allowed us and gave us the flexibility to do this in this way and I, I guess all of you also know that there was very limited um, grand jury availability um, during the last several months uh, so uh, it took some time to put this in we needed to impanel a long-term grand jury to handle this case and as uh, chief of detectives Essek told you as we have more long-term grand juries available to us we will see more and more of these type of uh, long-term investigations resulting in indictments Any yes. idea? Just how many members are in Julian trying to figure out what the 18 represents in terms of their number? I'll, I'll let the detectives answer that. Yeah, the, the Hoolies is a much larger group than what's portrayed today. Uh, what you're seeing right here, as far as the takedown is concerned, is the top of the food chain. You know, the individuals that are the true trigger pullers, the shot callers, 
and the individuals that uh, really founded the Hoolies, um, but the Hoolies does have several layers under the chill umbrella, and it, it does incorporate young individuals. You know, what a uh, takedown of this magnitude incorporates is that the younger individuals see the emphasis that we're putting upon and knowing the result, and hopefully it deters future crime. So are there hundreds of members of this gang? Like, any idea? I, I, under 100, but certainly a, a big grouping in and around Roosevelt. Uh, when the charges were filed, what is he in custody, and if You're referring to Deshaun Austin, I imagine? Yes. yes. So he was in custody, and he was um, now rearrested and charged with this case. Uh, his co-defendant was not in custody, and his co-defendant was picked out um, just within the last day or two and charged with the murder as well. And I should also say um, to the community at large um, that's concerned about how this case impacts this public safety is that we have reached out to many stakeholders who live in these uh, housing developments and clergy and other stakeholders and that we'll be communicating much more details um, to the community directly as a post uh, takedown conversation and to kind of address what the concern is that there are other gang members that are part of this umbrella and how we can try to prevent those gang members from sort of filling the void in leadership of the gang and continuing the violence. And so these are going to be ongoing conversations with our community leaders to try to prevent this gang violence from continuing. You know, we've kind of taken off the top layer of the gang in this indictment. Um, so we want to see if we can use this opportunity to stifle that gang activity, um, especially during the summer. Yes, sorry, a couple more. We could tell you, but then we'd have to <laughs> we have to get rid of you. <laughs> um, there's a lot of evidence. It's mostly based on a really comprehensive video um, compilation going hours before the shooting and hours after the shooting, tracking the vehicles, tracking the people in the car. Um, some, you know, we know where the Huli headquarter was, at least back then, where they would get together. Um, so there's a lot of intel involved in who these members are. Uh, again, we feel very confident and, um, you know, we feel very comfortable what the evidence in this case is, including some really unique items of clothing that were, when you get a high quality 4K TV, unlike this one, you can see really unique items of clothing that were later um, either recovered or a video shows them wearing. So there's a lot of good evidence in the case. Yes? Why did it take so long to charge the suspect and develop our well, I guess that kind of is similar to Noah's question. It's non, it was an ongoing investigation. Uh, we wanted to get it right. We wanted to get the evidence that a case of this magnitude requires. And as you know, um, the police had also been able to put uh, that shooter in custody on an unrelated homicide that has now been folded into this investigation. Yes, anything else? Yeah, just to follow up. The arrests that are made, you've still got dozens of people out there. Mm -hmm. How much of a dent does this make, if any? Well, I think it's going to make a tremendous dent because not only did we take out uh, these 18 men and they're in custody, just earlier this year we took out another 19 men who were involved in a lot of the back and forth shooting. So I think it's going to make a tremendous impact on safety, but I'll let the detectives answer more detailed um, questions in terms of what the approach is to stemming violence on these issues. But you're taking men who have demonstrated, it's not, it's on video, they've demonstrated their willingness to shoot day or night in front of children, in front of people. These are dangerous folks that have been indicted and we believe taking those layer of leadership of gangs off the streets will make it safer for everyone. But I'll let you handle it. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
You know, these long-term investigations, uh, the Gun Violence Suppression Division, of which Jason is uh, in charge of now, was established in two, 2014. Laser-focused investigations. We're, we're not interested in, in a number of people taken down. We're looking for the trigger pullers, the shooters, the most violent people in that gang. And then we can work through the community to maybe give those younger kids who aren't quite as violent over here, who are just gang members in name only, give them an alternative. Don't follow these guys, you're going to jail, you're looking at 25 years to life. But as far as the cases that we've taken down uh, in the past, you see historically, as soon as the, these, these trigger pullers, these violent offenders are taken down, the violence subsides in that area. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for coming. Good to see you. Chief. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Congratulations. Thank you. 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 Thank you